Hi, everyone. Thank you to BPAA for having me today. Uh, like I was introduced, my name is Natalie. Um, I am a graduate student at Johns Hopkins University, uh, which is where I am right now. Um, and today I'm going to be talking to you all about some of the first results and kind of what's been happening with JWST, our new space telescope in the last few months, and how this is really propelling us into what I think is going to be the golden age of studying exoplanets and their atmospheres. All right, so here's just a quick overview. Um, since there's quite a few people who weren't here the last time I gave a talk at BPA, I thought I would start with a little bit of background about myself. Um, so after graduating from Bainbridge High School in 2016, um, I went to beautiful upstate New York um, to attend the University of Rochester for my undergraduate studies. Um, I majored in physics and astronomy. Um, it's a wonderful department with a lot of really great people. And while there, I was able to kind of start doing science for the first time. Um, while there, I didn't study exoplanets. Um, instead, I studied a few different things. Um, my biggest project was studying star formation, uh, namely the feedback and the processes from star formation that feed back into their native clouds, the clouds that they form in. Um, through this, I got my first taste of observational astronomy, uh, which I really, really loved. Um, another project that I did was I actually simulated the creation of the largest impact crater on Earth. It's called the Vredefert Crater. It's in South Africa. Um, when it formed about 2 billion years ago, it was believed to be 300 kilometers in diameter, which is almost twice as large as the crater that's left from the impact that killed the dinosaurs. So it was a really big one. Luckily, there wasn't much life around at the time, um, but understanding these craters is really critical to um, understanding a lot of things um, about Earth and also other bodies in the solar system. Um, and so th through this project, I realized I really liked planets, um, but I didn't like the simulation part as much. Uh, so with that, it was time for me to decide what I wanted to do with my life. I decided I wanted to be an astronomer. I wanted to keep going. And so I was going to go to graduate school. Um, and when I decided what I wanted to study, I liked the observation for my first project. I liked the planet part of my second project. So that kind of naturally led me into this world of exoplanets. Um, and so a few things led me to decide to attend Johns Hopkins University, where I currently am for graduate school. Um, namely, uh, first of all, there's some really, really wonderful scientists here who do exactly what I like to do. Uh, my two advisors, uh, Nestor Espinosa and David Singh, are world-renowned exoplanet scientists, and I was going to be able to work with both of them. Um, and second of all, um, <laughs> is kind of the subject of this talk today, and has to do with this new space telescope, JWST, and it has to do with this place right here, uh, STSCI, Space Telescope Science Institute, which is actually on the John the Johns Hopkins campus. So here's a picture that I just took one day of a nice sunset on my campus as I was walking home. But in this, you can see really well that this building over here um, is my office. This building, this room right here is actually my office. And right across the street over here, you can see Space Telescope Science Institute, which is actually the home of the JWST Mission Control Center. Um, so the <laughs> we now joke that the center of the universe is Baltimore. Um, and namely the Johns Hopkins campus. And so because this was kind of in the back of all of our minds, um, I thought where better to go to grad school um, than the home of the new telescope. Um, so that led me to where I am today, studying exoplanets and their atmospheres. Um, and the reality of JWST has been um, all around me for the last, I guess, nine months or so now. Um, so I'm really excited to be able to talk to all of you about that today. Um, so we're going to start by going through what JWST is and also uh, the commissioning process of JWST, because that's a really, really amazing thing that I want to highlight that a, thousands of amazing scientists have been doing um, over the past eight months or so. So first, um, I imagine that everyone here has probably at least heard of JWST at this point, but I thought it would be important to at least introduce it. Um, so JWST is NASA's newest flagship space telescope. Um, it kind of follows in the footsteps of uh, the Hubble Space Telescope and the Spitzer Space Telescope as the new big thing. Um, and it is big. <laughs> it is a 6.8 meter telescope uh, that's segmented into these um, little hexagons you see here. And it is an infrared telescope. 
this means that it sees wavelengths of light that are longer than those that we see with our own eyes uh, in the optical. And this is kind of the, the easiest way to understand it is that wavelengths that are longer than the optical are how we see um, heat, how we see temperature. Um, and it's really important because we can't observe these types of wavelengths of light from the ground because our atmosphere itself is warm and so it's opaque. Um, and so we had another space telescope in the, op uh, in the infrared called Spitzer, but it sadly died about two years ago. Um, and so it's really great timing that we have this new space telescope um, that's ready for us. Um, but how has it kind of gotten here? Well, JWST launched on Christmas Day this past year. Um, my parents who were on the call will fondly remember me waking them up at 4.30 in the morning to watch the launch. Um, it was a really beautiful launch out of the Corot Spaceport in South America. Um, JWST is a really great international mission. It's not only headed by NASA, but also the Canadian Space Agency and the European Space Agency, along with a bunch of other partners. Um, and one of the things that the European Space Agency did was both give us access to the Crow spaceport, which is a really great um, equatorial spaceport, as well as give us the launch vehicle for the launch. Um, and the launch was great. <laughs> it, uh, people were pretty nervous, but it basically went as well as it possibly could have. Um, and right at the end, we were able to see JWST um, start its long journey. Um, you can see here, this is an image that was taken right after the telescope was um, kind of pushed off. Um, and then the very last thing that we got to see was this little deployment right here, which is actually the deployment of the solar panels. Um, it was really important that we saw this step uh, because if this step had failed, uh, that's it, no, no telescope <laughs> because it wouldn't have had any power. Uh, so we luckily got to see that step. It worked perfectly. Um, and and we had to say goodbye. Um, but this was really just the start of the journey for JWST. Had a long way to go and a lot to do. Um, so JWST, unlike a telescope like Hubble, um, is not an Earth orbiting telescope. It resides at a point called L2, which is the second Lagrange point. Uh, that sounds very complicated and it really isn't, but the easiest way to describe it um, is it's basically a gravitational parking lot, lot in space. Um, it's a spot where we're able to put satellites in a very low energy way that they can orbit it um, without having to use very much fuel. Um, this is a little, this is really good for the science because one of the important things about an infrared space telescope is it has to be cold. Um, and putting it further away from the sun is better to keep it colder. Um, but it's a little bit scary because like I said, it isn't nearby Earth. Um, which means that things like servicing missions aren't possible. Uh, for those of you who remember when the Hubble Space Telescope was first launched, you'll remember that there were a lot of problems with it. We literally had to put a contact lens on Hubble because of how bad the optics worked. Um, and something like that is completely impossible for JWST, which had people pretty nervous. Um, I say completely impossible, but there are there is a team that's trying to build robots that would be able to visit it at L2, but that is uh, just science fiction at this point. Um, so yeah, so JWST over the course of about a month traveled all the way to L2, which is about uh, 1.5 million kilometers away, which is about a, a million miles. Uh, so it's pretty far. Um, but the journey went great. <laughs> we used an optimal amount of fuel to get there, um, such that the mission lifetime for JWST actually went from five years, which was the original required lifetime by NASA to predicted to now maybe up to 20 years, which is very exciting. Uh, but on its way to L2, uh, the telescope wasn't just doing nothing. It actually had some very important things to do. Um, namely, it had to unfold. Uh, because if you look at this image that I showed of um, JWST when it first launched, it looks very different from this big, beautiful golden telescope that I showed in this clean room. Um, and that's because in order to fit into the rocket, it had to be folded up in a very specific way. Um, this was very scary <laughs> because the way that it was folded and the complexity of this telescope meant that it had about 300 single point failures. Uh, that means that if any of those points failed, it was kind of game over for the mission. Um, any engineer in the world will tell you that that is an awful idea for something that we can't affect, 
uh, but that's kind of NASA's thing, right? Uh, JPL saying is dare mighty things. So we had to try. Uh, the first thing that had to unfold with this telescope is what we call the sun shield, which is these this big shiny kind of foil looking structure that's below the telescope. This is really, really crucial because this is going to keep the telescope cold um, at all times. Basically, no matter how JWST is oriented, this sun shield will be facing the sun such that um, the heat will be reflected away from it. And at this point, I think it's good to give a little bit of scale to this telescope since all the pictures of it are just floating in space. It can be pretty hard to see kind of how massive it is. So this is a picture of the sun shield of JWST as it was um, unfolded during a test in the clean room and you can see all these people around it. Uh, it's pretty big. It's about the size of a tennis court. Um, and this was a really, really scary part because non-rigid objects in space are very scary. Uh, they don't, you're not able to predict its motion fully. Um, there, there's a potential for like snags or like a rip even. Um, and so a lot of the points of failure were in this sun shield. Uh, but luckily it went great. <laughs> uh, once that unfurled, which took a long time, we were very slow with that to make sure that nothing caught. Um, the next thing that had to happen, that was, this is the most mission critical point. Um, so people were very nervous. I believe that this was about 20 days in and people, uh, this was the point that had to happen is the um, unfolding of the secondary mirror supports. So what this is, is this is the point that has to focus the light from the telescope. Um, and if this doesn't deploy, the instruments can't get any light to them, which would have been really bad. Um, but again, went perfectly. They snapped into place just as planned. And then the final thing that needed to happen was the uh, what we call the wings of the telescope had to unfold. Um, the hexagonal shape isn't uh, that that doesn't really fit into a rocket, and so we had to put three panels on each side, kind of on these wings that would unfold. Um, and people were pretty nervous. I don't know the details of why, but People were really nervous about this point. Um, I know some of the engineers pretty well who worked on this and they were so ready for this part to fail that they had fully set up um, observation techniques if it had failed to just use this center part of the telescope. Um, but it didn't. Uh, all of their prep work was for nothing. Um, the telescope literally went perfectly, all of the unfolding. Um, so yeah, that was great, <laughs> very exciting. Um, so that took about a month, like I said, so this, all of this unfurling happened on its way to L2 so that when it arrived there, it would be ready to start cooling down and to start the commissioning process, which is the actual science part. Um, this, they gave, well, NASA gave Space Telescope, um, about five months to do this process. And it was really important that they got it done in this time frame. Um, and this was when it was like all hands on deck here at Space Telescope. Uh, both of my thesis advisors were, invi were involved in the commissioning process, um, and I was lucky if I got to see them like once a week. Um, this was like all encompassing um, for all the people who are working on it. But obviously it's a very important thing, so I'm glad that they did that. Uh, so what happened during this commissioning? Well, first, um, we had to make sure that everything was okay with the mirrors. <laughs> everything went okay. Um, and so this is actually a selfie that was taken right after the telescope was fully deployed and put into its spot at L2. This was taken um, with one of the instruments called NIRCAM. Um, and what's actually happening in this image is that we told the telescope to point at a star. Um, and you, as you can probably tell from this image, uh, one segment pointed at the star and the rest didn't, um, which may sound bad at first, but this was very much expected. Um, this is also everyone's favorite segment. This is called A1. We love this segment. <laughs> it performs the best all the time. Um, but okay, so we have this one segment that's doing what it's supposed to, um, but it doesn't look like everyone else is. Um, we also took an image with the instrument of what this saw, um, and this is what the telescope was seeing. So at first you might see this image and be like, oh, it's like a star field. Uh, but it isn't. This is one star that's projected a bunch of different times all over space in a way that's clearly not right. Um, so what we had to do was align each of the mirrors separately, because each of these hexagons is kind of like its own telescope, and we need them to work together. So there's a fun little movie that these are real motions that the telescope did. 
um, where you can see in here that each one of these little hexagons is able to move independently from the other segments. Um, they're actually able to move really in really amazing ways. They're able to um, move like laterally a little bit. They're able to rotate. They're able to um, tilt. And they're even able to change their curvature a very small amount by changing the struts beneath the telescope. Um, and so we basically would take images and try to align it so that until all of these segments were looking at the same thing. Uh, but this was a very scary process because basically of that same thing that I keep talking about, which is heat. Um, so all electronics give off heat, right? But most of the electronics for this entire telescope are held on the opposite side of that sun shield I was talking about before so that all of their heat leakage won't uh, affect any of the telescope instruments because this telescope has to be very, very, very cold in order to work. Um, but motors are required, if the motors want to change the mirrors, they're required to be touching the mirrors. Um, and if they want to do work, they have to let off heat. Um, and this is a very scary thing. So there were very, very strict limits on how much each of these, uh, each of the motors can move before we had to allow it to cool off again. But we're on a very strict time scale. And so I actually know the person who was in charge of this process. His name is Laurent Poyo. He's an amazing scientist. Um, and he optimized perfectly so that every time that it would cool down, we had the next move to go. And it literally went as perfectly as we could have imagined it could have gone. Um, so this took about two months because of um, the difficulties with the pointings. And we really wanted to make it as perfect as possible because the idea is that we will basically never change this again. Um, because of a whole bunch of uh, <laughs> things with the science, basically. So we aligned it as best we can. And then Space Telescope Science Institute gave us this image, which is the telescope alignment um, evaluation image. And this was the first image we got from JWST and astronomers everywhere lost their minds. <laughs> um, this, OK, so a really good thing to know when you're looking at space telescope images um, first is that any sort of thing, like it's really obvious in this picture because we're looking at a star, but any of the things that have these big spikes like this, which are called diffraction spikes, um, those are point sources, which means that they're stars. Um, the, the, the reasoning for the diffraction spikes and the shape of it um, is a little bit more complex. It depends on the shape of the telescope, um, as well as the primary and secondary mirror struts, um, as well as kind of the behavior of light. Um, but this will always be true no matter what telescope you're looking at. And so obviously you see this star like this, but also you see all of these other stars here, right? The, this one and all these, um, but anything in this image that doesn't have those diffraction spikes is a galaxy. All of these are galaxies. And so before we even got any science from um, James Webb, we were given this beautiful uh, image. And we weren't given any information about it. This was literally supposed to be given to us to be like, OK, it's working. <laughs> but astronomers within the hour had located what star this was, the alignment of the image. They knew what all these background galaxies were. And we're starting to do science um, <laughs> basically as soon as possible, which was a really crazy thing to see. Um, but the most important thing to know from this image is that it's working perfectly. It basically couldn't have gone better up until this point. Um, yeah, so now the telescope is focused. What happens next? Well, um, telescopes being able to look at things is cool and all, but actually that's a very, very, very small part of the entire process. What's much more important is the instruments. Um, so JWST has four separate instruments. We have three near infrared instruments and one mid infrared instrument. Um, the three near infrared ones are called near spec, nearest, and near cam, and NERI is our mid infrared instrument. Um, and each of these instruments has a whole bunch of different modes. Um, these modes are for different things. Uh, they do different types of science, and each one of them need to be commissioned separately. Each one of these is its own team. Um, for example, um, you see these time series observations here, here, bright object time series, all of these, this, um, and these two modes um, are all exoplanet modes. Um, and so exoplanet scientists at Space Telescope, namely my advisors, <laughs> um, were working very hard to make sure that these modes were working as we wanted them to before we were able to start science. Um, this 
process took the final two and a half, two-ish months of commissioning. Um, and this was all leading up, this was, this had a very strict deadline on it because we, we had, NASA gave us a date. They gave us July 12th and they were like, we have, you guys have to be able to release images by that day. And as you might be able to see, these dates on the bottom are when the commissioning was finished and we cut it pretty close. <laughs> uh, the chronography mode for NIRCAM was the last one to, to finish and it finished only two days before um, we were required to, which is a little bit scary, but we did it. Um, so that was great. Um, and so in the last um, week or so before um, we were told by NASA that we had to have science ready, um, Space Telescope Science Institute took a bunch of images that are called um, the early release observations. Um, before I get into that, I'm going to do a quick science lesson just so that you can, everyone fully appreciates the next images. Um, and that is that you can see, so the easiest thing to understand with space telescopes is imaging, right? You can see here's a mode, this is imaging, 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 near spec, this one instrument doesn't have any imaging uh, parts of it. Um, but we can see a lot more often, especially in near spec, is this word spectroscopy. Um, and what is spectroscopy? Well, spectroscopy is really how astronomers do most of their research. Unfortunately for me, I, <laughs> I learned this um, when I was a freshman studying astronomy, and it made me very sad um, that most of the time, unfortunately, we don't get to look at the very pretty photographs and just like marvel at them. Um, instead, we're using this thing called spectroscopy. Um, and what this is, is basically taking um, a generic light source and splitting it into all of its components. Um, so in here, this is an example of like particularly for the sun. So we take in sunlight and we split it into different parts of the visible light spectrum. Um, you see this in life all the time. Anytime you see a rainbow, it's spectroscopy that's happening due to the reflection of water droplets in the atmosphere. Um, you also see this with lenses and windows even all the time. Um, but these constituent parts of the light um, are what tells us all of our science about astronomy basically. And that's because, um, so if you have a, a true white light source, like if you have like a um, like a flashlight and you shine it, um, it will it will truly be like a full rainbow. But most of the time, um, that isn't what it's actually going to be. What it's going to be is this rainbow that has a few things missing from it. Um, it has these like dark spots that we call absorption. Um, and due to some pretty complicated physics that um, if anyone has any questions about, I can talk a little bit more about later. Um, we know very precisely that these correspond to specific elements and molecules in the universe. Um, and we know this so precisely that we can see, like we can like see, for example, here, that we know that these dips in this spectrum correspond to hydrogen. And we've mapped this out for millions of transitions of molecules and elements um, throughout everything that we know. Um, and so this is how we get our information from astronomical images. We look at the locations of elements and molecules and we map out what that means to the science. Um, and so that means most of the time what astronomers are looking at looks more like this than the nice images that you usually see. Um, this is actually real data. This is data from um, the nearest instrument, which is um, one of the very cool modes. And this is an actual observation of an exoplanet. Um, not that you would know that <laughs> by looking at this image. Um, yeah, so with that little science lesson, let's move on to talking about the first science results. Um, so like I said, uh, NASA, once the telescope was fully done, NASA asked us as astronomers to basically look at a few different things. Um, Space Telescope Science Institute chose these images as the early release observations and basically wanted to, to show some things that truly illustrated how well the telescope was working. Because like I said, everything has gone amazingly. <laughs> um, and so they chose five different uh, things to look at over a variety of different sciences. Um, and this is the result. So uh, for those of you who were paying attention when all of this were happening, uh, you'll know that this image, which is JWST's first deep field of a region called SMAX 0723, um, was actually shown by President Biden the night before the official NASA press release. Um, and this region 
honestly, if I had been in charge of it, this is not the region I would have shown first, because I think it requires quite a bit of science to know why it's really fun. Because um, if you look at this first, you might think like, oh, it doesn't look that good. Like, it's kind of like smudgy. There's like weird things going on. Are you sure it's like focused right? Um, <laughs> but it is focused right, I promise. Um, what's actually going on in this image is that you can see that there is these like dots, these very bright things right in the middle here. Um, and those are called lenticular galaxies. They're very, very massive galaxies. Um, and together, they're actually warping the space time um, so much due to their mass that they're projecting images of things behind them um, in, a, in something that we call a gravitational lens. Uh, this is basically a natural telescope. What's happening is that very things that are much farther away from us behind this, um, these galaxies are actually being smeared by the space time around into these kind of smeared, weird line looking circular things that you see around it. Um, this is a really amazing technique that was actually predicted long before we saw it by Einstein. Um, and we're able to see things that are much farther away and get very clear information um, due to multiple images that tell us a lot about the properties of both these galaxies in the middle, but also these further away things. Um, and what I'm going to overplot here is actually um, from a paper that analyzed this. And what's going on here is that I know it's very confusing, but basically you can see that there's things it's like here it says like 1.1, 1.2, 1.3. And so what that means is that this is the same source. This is the same galaxy being shown multiple times. So you see it again here. This is one, two, three. These are all the same object. You can see over here there's like multiple 17s. Um, this is like 19. All of these are um, the same source. So we map out um, the, the gravitational effects from all these galaxies, and this is what it tells us. Um, and then we're able to figure out what's going on with this whole picture together, um, which is really amazing and very hard to do. <laughs> and the really amazing thing is that this, the paper that I took this plot from came out the day after we got this image. Within 24 hours, astronomers made this map of all of these regions. Uh, we were really ready for this science data. Um, yeah, so that is JWST's first deep field. Next, I'm going to be talking about a region, once it lives, called Stefan's Quintet, which is also this really, really beautiful example. Um, if you look up a, an image of Stefan's Quintet before this with like Hubble, um, the difference in images is striking. Uh, it's so amazing that like in this galaxy, for example, which is actually um, in the, it looks like all five of these, so one, two, three, four, five, it looks like all five of these galaxies are interacting. Um, in reality, these four are interacting, and this is actually a foreground galaxy, so it's actually quite a bit closer to us, um, but these galaxies were discovered in like the 1700s, so they definitely didn't know the distances to these objects then. Um, but in this galaxy, we're even able to resolve individual stars um, because of how amazing the resolution of JWST is. Um, but for these background galaxies, they are in fact interacting. They are all at the same distance from us. And the interacting effects are causing some really crazy things to happen. Um, so like, for example, here in this big stream that's coming off this galaxy, you can see a bunch of dust, maybe even like a dwarf galaxy that's being uh, shepherded along. Um, here you can see friction due to shock waves that are due to these galaxies interacting with each other. Um, there's also some additional shock waves here. Um, and this is really important because it tells us a lot about galaxy evolution. Um, because over time, um, galaxies have, ch ch they change just like anything else. Um, and one of the big ways that they change is that they interact with each other. Um, for those of you who, who are very interested in galaxies, you'll know that for example, um, Andromeda, which is our closest neighboring galaxy, will collide with the Milky Way in however long distance in the future. Um, so understanding the way that these galaxies are interacting is really important, especially when we look back in time um, through looking at things that are further away from us um, and seeing how things have changed um, with galaxies um, through the evolution of the universe. So that's Stephen Stefan's quintet. He's French, I should say it right. Um, Next is, this is one that we all knew was going to happen. Uh, we, so we weren't told what the actual objects were going to be before uh, they were released. 
but everyone could have guessed that the Ring Nebula was going to be included because it's really like everyone loves this one. <laughs> um, so what's going on in this image is there's a little tiny uh, star in the middle. You would think that the source of all this would be this big star, but it's actually not. It's actually this tiny star right here, which you can see actually much better in this image, this star right here. Um, and so actually what I'm showing here is on the left is a image from NearCam, um, which is one of our near infrared instruments. And on the right is from Nearing, which is our mid infrared instrument. So this is much longer wavelength. You can see it's quite a bit um, like muddier kind of, it's like not as high resolution. That's uh, required by the laws of physics basically. Um, but what's happening is that this star in the middle has basically died. Um, it has gone from being a relatively low mass star, probably a star kind of like our sun, um, and it has become a white dwarf and basically blown off its atmosphere um, once it was no longer able to support its own weight. Um, and so what this does is it creates these huge um, shock waves and these like this material that's being pushed away from the star very rapidly. Um, and this happens at multiple different epochs. And so you're able to see these different shell structures. And especially in the near cam image, the resolution of these effects is staggering. We're able to do whole new physics um, basically due to the shock waves of these different, um, these gas clouds and these dust clouds. Um, it's really, really astounding. Um, and I think this image illustrates something else that uh, has been become very apparent to us through this science is that um, now that we have this new telescope, every image that we look at is a deep field. Every image that we're looking at is getting so much more information than just uh, what is happening in the main focus of the image. For example, I don't know why, because I don't study galaxies, but people are very excited about this galaxy right here. <laughs> For some reason, it's very exciting. Um, and that's, and you know, again, if you look at the diffraction spikes, you can see stars here and here and here, but there's galaxies in the background here everywhere. Um, and you can do science with those just as well as you can do with everything else. Um, yes. So moving on to our last image and my personal favorite is the Kriana Nebula. These are very lovingly called the cosmic cliffs because if you if you kind of squint, you can probably see these kind of could be like cliffs. <laughs> um, but what's going on here is kind of the opposite of the Ring Nebula. This is where stars are being born. Um, so this is a really big cloud of gas and dust um, where it's basically a stellar nursery. And so this is the type of science I did as an undergrad, and so I have a very soft spot for it. Um, in particular, you can see these really cool um, kind of shock front looking structures right here. And these are literal shock waves that are being pushed out into space by forming stars. Just like you would imagine, like when a, when a jet on Earth goes supersonic, you get shock waves. It's that same process that's happening. Um, and it's happening, and this is proof that stars are forming in this region. This is proof that they um, are starting to accrete matter um, and build new solar systems. And so this is a really beautiful one. Like every astronomer that I know has, this is their background on their computer now. Um, it's a really amazing one. Um, yeah, so that is four of our um, EROs, our early release observations. Um, I said that there's five and there's one more. Um, and it's going to be a little bit less fun to look at at first, but I promise you it's just as exciting. Um, and I'm going to use this chance to kind of move into what I do personally, which is looking at exoplanets and their atmospheres. So the last ERO, um, the last early re release observation was a transit of a planet that we call WASP-96b. Um, astronomy names, they get very annoying, but we just kind of deal with it. Um, and so what's going on here, what we're showing in this image is if you can imagine a star um, that has a planet rotating or orbiting it, um, and you imagine that it's edge on so that we're seeing it on, on its plane, you can imagine that as the planet passes in front of its star, it will block some of the light from that star. It's a very small amount of the light. Um, <laughs> it's for the best cases, it's about 1% of the light. Um, but we as astronomers, we have to work with that, and so we do. Um, and we basically see a dimming of the star due to that planet moving in front of its host. Um, and that's what's, what you're seeing here. And the really amazing thing is that this is literally what you see. You can see the transit by with your naked eye, um, with this telescope, of course, uh, which is something that we have never been able to do before. Um, for a little bit of context, for those of you who don't know much about exoplanets, 
Um, exoplanets is an incredibly new field. It's been theorized for a long time, but the first exoplanet was only found about 25 years ago. Um, a really good friend in my program named Jacob, he was actually born on the same day that the first exoplanet was discovered. So it's basically my generation is the same age as this field. Um, and so because of that, JWST is our first chance to have an instrument that was made with us in mind, because our uh, astronomical needs are incredibly different than, that, than those of most subfields of astronomy. Um, and we're really, really seeing um, that with the initial data. People wouldn't literally, when the first astronomers saw this, um, they didn't believe it. That's how that's how cool it is. <laughs> and this was this is very near and dear to my heart because um, this was all done by one of my advisors that I'm very proud of that I'll I'll talk about more in a second. Um, but this is so this is great because it tells us how big this planet is, um, which in itself tells us a lot of information about what type of planet it is. Um, but that really isn't everything. Um, and so what we do instead is using that spectroscopy that I was talking about, we do a method called transmission spectroscopy, in which we look at the transit of the planet in different wavelengths of light. Um, this basically tells us what exists in the atmosphere, because like I said, we've mapped out very well what these different, um, we call them opacity sources are at different wavelengths. And so we're able to look at some wavelength and be like, hmm, what element or what molecule corresponds to this space? And we can tell, oh, it's potassium, it's sodium, it's water, it's carbon monoxide, it's carbon dioxide. And the difference in size tells us how much of that element is present in the atmosphere. And so doing this technique, um, we're able to get a spectrum. This is a spectrum of an exoplanet. And so what this is, is it's literally showing us the contents of the atmosphere of a planet in a whole nother system. Um, this is truly, in my opinion, the most mind blowing thing that's going to be done with JWST. Um, this right here, so what we're seeing in this spectrum is um, evidence of water in this planet's atmosphere. Uh, now, it's not quite necessarily as exciting as, some, as seeing, for example, water on Earth, because this is a planet called a hot Jupiter, which is very different than the planet that we're familiar with. Um, it is a planet that's like Jupiter, but it's orbiting close, either like as close to its host star as Mercury is to our star, which is a really, really weird thing. There's a whole bunch um, in the last talk I gave, which I believe is recorded and posted. Um, you can hear me talk about why this is so weird, um, but basically it's really weird. <laughs> um, but we can tell from this that we're seeing water vapor in the upper atmosphere of this planet. Um, like I said, this spectrum is really, really important to me personally, and I, I really love it because my one of my advisors, Nestor Espinoza, who's an amazing scientist, did this spectrum 100% on his own. Um, all of the other uh, early release observations were done by big teams, but this science is so complex and specific that he was the one who had to do it on his own. He was given two days to do this, and he made this amazing thing. Um, and it's now been validated by a bunch of groups of scientists who basically said that they couldn't have done better than him. So we're very proud of him for that. <laughs> um, and also this is one planet, this is one transit of one planet, um, which is amazing. Um, so yeah, so that is the end of the early release observations. But at the same time that the early release observations were being taken, there was a whole nother group of observations called the ERS, the early release science observations that were being taken simultaneously. Um, and these, the entire point of these observations were the director of Space Telescope Science Institute gave it out to a bunch of different subfields and was like, what can you do with very little time that shows how amazing this um, telescope is operating? And I'm lucky enough to be part of one of these teams. I'm part of the early release science transiting exoplanet team. Um, and so we got our data around the same time that this data was taken. Um, and we, I was, I'm really glad that it came out before this talk because I wasn't sure it was going to, but it has. Um, so we were observing a planet called WASP-39b, and we were able to find evidence of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere of this planet for the first time ever, which is very exciting. Yay! <laughs> you can see my name down on this list here. <laughs> um, so this was, this was really, really, really exciting. Um, we, we were so excited when this first happened that people couldn't believe us because of how amazing the signal was. Um, here, this is from the press release. 
that's showing exactly what I was saying, where you can see in, um, so this is the transit of this planet WASP 39b, and you can see that these red points, which are parts of the atmosphere that don't, can, that aren't at the wavelength of carbon dioxide, um, are slightly shallower than the parts of the wavelength that do contain carbon dioxide. Um, and this tells us that this element, or this molecule in this case, is present. Um, this is the actual spectrum from the paper. Um, I'm really proud of this too, because this plot was made by one of my best friends here in graduate school, Zafar. Um, and this shows this huge feature right here is the carbon dioxide feature. Um, for those of you who know any sort of statistics, this is a almost 40 sigma detection, which means that it means that it's there. <laughs> that, that means that um, it's basically inconceivable that we got it wrong. So that's great. We're very excited about it. Um, we are currently in the process of doing this same sort of analysis um, for four other data sets for the same target. And also a bunch of other planets have already been observed. But I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. Um, and so this is one of the methods of observing exoplanet atmospheres. There's actually a second, which is using a, a technique called direct imaging, um, which just like it sounds like is literally directly imaging the exoplanet. Um, this is really difficult because stars are very bright and planets are very dim, but we use a technique called coronography, which, in which we literally block out the star. So we put a mask in front of the star, and this allows us to see the planet um, because using some very fancy techniques, it's still very difficult even if we're able to do that, um, but we're able to directly see the star. Um, and I don't do this exact science, but um, one of my best friends in grad school was part of this project that did this. Um, and we're able, they're able to do very similar types of science, but on very different planets. Um, this type of observation requires the planet to be very far from the star, um, unlike our science, which usually requires the planet to be very close to its star, and so they're very complementary. Um, so this is a spectrum um, of this um, directly image target, and kind of similarly, you see evidence, for example, here of water, and here of, this is a model of what we think that carbon dioxide would look like, all these peaks, it's inverted, um, and you can see that really beautifully here. So we... <laughs> Basically, we're doing it. We're doing exoplanet science. We're observing the atmospheres of these planets, and it is working basically as well as we could have imagined, which is uh, really exciting. I've seen a lot of astronomers cry in the last few weeks. <laughs> um, but I want to finish off my talk by talking a little bit about what's next. I wish I could show you a few more results, but unfortunately, they are currently embargoed, <laughs> and so I can't. But hopefully, you'll be seeing them in the news relatively soon. Um, but one of the big things that I want to um, kind of refresh at this point in the talk, or I guess I haven't actually said, so state at this point in the talk, and it, because it's something that we have been told a lot, is that all of the science that I've shown up until this point was taken in one week. Only one week took all of this amazing science. Since then, it's been, I don't know, almost two months. So a lot more science has been taken. And like I said earlier in the talk, we now think that JWST could survive up to maybe 20 years. Um, and so the amount of science and the understanding of the universe that we're going to get from this telescope is literally inconceivable at this point. Um, we're getting new amazing images basically every day now. I wanted to show one in particular just because I, I really love this one. This one came out this week of a region called the Tarantula Nebula. Um, it's very like <laughs> NASA's really going in on the whole it's we're getting into fall and it's almost Halloween thing with this color palette, like the oranges and blacks and stuff. Um, but this is another star formation region, very beautiful. But we're basically getting this quality of image regularly now. Um, so we aren't slowing down. <laughs> it may seem like it because you've probably been seeing a little bit less in the news, but that's because all the science teams are now doing their science. They have their data. It takes a little bit to get validated and to do our due diligence as scientists. Um, but I'm going to point out a few things in particular towards planets that I think that everyone should have their eyes open for. Um, the first one of this, and this is something that had, I didn't really have a chance to talk about in the main part, but this was taken, this is data that's already also been taken, um, is don't forget the solar system. Uh, JWST is, is mostly advertising how it's looking at the universe um, outside of us, but it can also look at things in our solar system. So for example, here's two images that have already been taken of Jupiter. 
Um, this one was during commissioning as kind of a calibration image, but this one is a full science image. And this is just like, wow, like uh, we were all obsessed with this when it first came out. Um, you can see Aurora signatures up at the poles. You can see these kind of blue hazes around the outside that we think are real and we actually aren't entirely sure the composition of yet. Um, and you can even see the ring. You can see Jupiter's ring right here, which is beautiful. It's amazing. Um, there's a lot of really exciting solar system science is being done, which um, we are, the relationship of exoplanets with solar system planets is very complex and fun. Um, they kind of feed into each other in this really cool way. And so I'm really excited what the solar system scientists are going to do. But talking about exoplanets, um, there's three big things that I think are going to be coming out in the very short future that I think are incredibly exciting. Um, the first is planets around white dwarfs. So these are these stars that I was telling you about. Um, I'll go back to this image really fast. So this is the surroundings of a white dwarf, this insane explosion of material, right? Um, but we've detected planets that seem to have survived this insane explosion um, and we're gonna be observing them. We don't really understand how they've changed over the course of this. We don't know how they've survived, how they still have atmospheres, how they weren't blown away or engulfed. Um, and so we're gonna be learning a lot about that in a really exciting way. We truly have no idea what to expect from this. Um, so that's very exciting. Um, secondly, is we've discovered a lot of exoplanets. Again, if, you're in, if this interests you, um, I gave a talk last year where I talked a lot more about these types of planets. Um, but we've discovered a lot of exoplanets since we started these studies that aren't like anything that we see in our solar system. Um, and a really notable class of these we call the sub-Neptunes. We aren't necessarily the most creative, <laughs> but these are basically planets that lie in between like an Earth-like terrestrial planet and like a Neptune-like ice giant. Um, and the big thing is that we think that these are the most common planets that exist at least in our galaxy, if not in the universe. Um, but we don't have one in our solar system, which in itself is very weird. Um, but because we don't have one in our solar system with which to compare to, we have truly no idea what these atmospheres look like. Um, observations with HST, the Hubble Space Telescope, were um, kind of attempted, but these are very small planets, and so it's very difficult to do. Uh, but we're going to be looking at these a lot in the very near future. Um, and then the last one I'm going to talk about, this one <laughs> is very near and dear to my heart, um, is the TRAPPIST-1 system, in particular TRAPPIST-1e. Um, so the TRAPPIST-1 system has been really, um, is really popular uh, because it's a, it's a really interesting system. It's a very, very, very small star that's surrounded by seven planets that are Earth-like, they're terrestrial. Um, Earth-like is kind of a broad term, but they are rocky. Um, they're, they're like our kind of rocky planets, so these four inner planets in our solar system. Um, and notable among these is TRAPPIST-1e, this one right here that I put up this travel poster for. Uh, I literally have it in my room. It's right there. <laughs> um, and the notable thing about this planet is that it is considered to be the most habitable exoplanet. Um, that means a lot of things that are a little bit confusing, um, but basically it is our best chance at observing a planet that we think is habitable with JWST. And I'm really excited because I'm going to be on the team that does these observations. Um, I was recently added to this team and I am beyond excited. Uh, there's a lot of amazing science that we're going to be able to do with it. Um, we hope to see something. I'm going to leave it at that. That is kind of um, the end of this talk. Hopefully, if I give another talk in a year or two, we'll have results on this planet. Um, but I hope that I've given you reason to believe that the next at least 20 years of astronomy is really going to be an amazing thing to witness. All right. Thank you, Natalie. Can you hear me? Okay. We, we lost our connection briefly right at the end, but it came back in just as you were wrapping up. So oh, good. Uh, uh, thank you very much and con congratulations for uh, joining the, the TRAPPIST-1E team. I'm Thank sure you. that's going to be very exciting. And um, if anyone has any question for Natalie, uh, use the raise hand button uh, or write your question in the chat and I'll read it. So are there any questions? Okay, we've got somebody here in the room. Go ahead. She can hear you with the microphone here. How many exoplanets are known currently and how many more are expected to be found? 
That's a great question. Yeah. Um, so we currently know of about 5,000 exoplanets, um, but this is very constrained due to our own biases. Um, so the current, with the exoplanets that we do know of, um, it's believed through the statistical methods that we use that exoplanets or planets around other stars are at least as numerous as the stars themselves. So we believe that the most likely case is that a star will host at least one planet. Um, so that means that there are at least as many exoplanets as there are um, stars in the sky, which is a very exciting thing to know. Okay, and you have a question? At Lagrange point one, where the telescope is sitting, is there a way to tell if there's collecting dust or debris or anything there? Because it is kind of a, you know, a parking spot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great question. Um, it's actually uh, Lagrange point two. It doesn't really matter, but <laughs> uh, Lagrange point one is the one that's in front. Lagrange point two is one that's behind. Um, but yeah, so we, um, there's a few different ways that we're able to tell. Um, one of the things that you might have heard that hap has happened already with the telescope is that we've had our first micrometeoroid impact which means that the telescope was impacted by a small asteroid. Um, this is expected, very expected. It's, it's literally required basically for something that's in space. Um, but we're able to tell, we aren't able to tell through like images itself, but there's a team called the Wavefront Guidance Sensor Team who is very carefully taking um, calibration information from the telescope. And so basically like the way that we found out that this um, micrometeoroid impact happened is that we saw that one of the um, hexagons, one of those mirror segments, tilted a little bit, and it wasn't a planned tilt. Okay. And that tilt um, basically was a sign that something went wrong. Um, and so, yeah, we have, there's a bunch of different um, kind of calibration uh, sensors on board. For example, um, with dust, um, there is like essentially it will, it, the instruments will start to let in less light during its calibration settings than it than necessarily expected. Um, but any like small aberrations or like any small problems are less likely to be noticed. But overall, it's probably not a huge deal. Okay, and go ahead with your question. Um, how long in advance was L2 um, distinguished as being the parking spot for JBLM and are there uh, other science instruments at some of the other Lagrange points? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Yeah, um, so L2 was uh, known that it was, we knew that we were gonna put JWST at L2 for quite a long time. Um, and it's basically part of the requirements. If JWST was closer than L2, it, uh, the sun shield would have to be even more intensive. And that was kind of like a nice point at which it needed a sun shield still. But for example, this crazy like robot refueling idea is still technically feasible. Um, and there are other um, instruments at um, L2. I believe that there's about a dozen currently at L2, um, but there's a bunch more planned um, including at least three exoplanet specific missions that are trying to get funded currently, um, partially because of how easy it kind of was to get JWST there. How has the JWST images of the faraway galaxies challenged or confirmed our understanding of the Big Bang theory? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, okay. So this is something that was very was kind of happening in the popular science media about a month ago, um, saying that there were some observations of faraway galaxies that, that didn't fit with our current view of the Big Bang Theory. Um, every astronomer I know disagrees with that. <laughs> um, for as a, a big um, kind of asterisk on all of the science that uses um, what we call absolute calibrations at this point, which is things like uh, galaxy observations. So the way that we, um, the way as a kind of like a step back, the way that we observe um, how far away things are in the universe is that we observe this thing called redshift, mm -hmm. which basically is um, though as light travels to us due to the expansion of the universe, um, the wavelengths of light become longer. And so this makes things redder. Um, and calibrating how much redshift has happened with galaxies is a really difficult thing. Um, notably, some of the very fast science that was done with exoplanet, or not exoplanet, sorry, galaxy redshift calculations have already been proved to be wrong. 
um, and wrong by a significant amount <laughs> because the, the absolute calibrations of telescopes are very difficult. Um, by absolute, I mean the literal amount of light that's coming from the telescope um, because a lot of observations um, are actually like more like relative measurements or re measurements relative to each other or relative to some um, additional source. Um, and so kind of a lot of the observations that uh, people were trying to use to disprove the Big Bang Theory um, weren't necessarily validated yet. Um, but for all I know, once they are validated, they might still challenge it. Um, but unfortunately, at this point, nothing quite that exciting has happened. Okay, uh, another question in the chat. Uh, has JWST granted you, your team, enough time to observe TRAPPIST-1E multiple times to track possible periodic changes in biosignatures like CO2, similar to how Earth's CO2 changes over the seasons? That's a, that's a great question. Um, so the answer is kind of yes and kind of no. <laughs> um, so we... Uh, so the, the observations of TRAPPIST-1E that are happening during this first sort of cycle um, are using something called GTO time, which is guaranteed time observations. Um, this is time that's given to people who worked on the instruments of the telescopes that they are able to do whatever they want to with. Um, and so the idea is they basically took this target because they knew if they didn't, someone else would. Um, and they're using the amount of time that they were given in order to do these observations. Um, but the big thing is that um, these signals are buildable. And so, for example, we plan on, um, we're already, before we even get the first observations of TRAPPIST-1E, which happen next October, um, we are already going to be proposing for additional observations of TRAPPIST-1E this next cycle, which is in January. Um, it's kind of inevitable that a system like this will get more time because people are really excited about it. Um, so that's kind of the first part. The second part about um, the, the, the seasonal variation of biosignatures um, is a really good question. And unfortunately, we don't have the capability to observe that type of signal um, because the way that we observe the atmospheres of very small planets is that we have to stack multiple observations together. And so if they were changing on a seasonal variation, like a seasonal basis, um, we'd be averaging those signals together. Um, which is something that people actually are a little bit concerned about because if there is some sort of seasonal variation, we might be averaging over it in a way that gets rid of it. Um, but not until we have the next large space telescope will we, will we be able to do these observations in one kind of transit that would allow us to look for these variations, unfortunately. Okay, and it would also seem like just the, the observational geometry, we're looking at the star, which is very far away. So we only see the planet transit at a particular point in its orbit. So it would be the mm -hmm. same same season every time around. Um, yes. Unless, For, it's, unless it's presetting. Yeah, um, and also uh, it's a little bit different because, well, TRAPPIST-1E isn't, but for example, other planets in the TRAPPIST system are tidally locked and so seasons work a little bit differently. Um, but we actually can observe different um, seasonal variations through what we call a phase curve, which is when we observe the entire orbit of the planet. Um, you don't get necessarily exact atmospheric features in that way, but you do sense variations over the cycle. Um, so that is an observation. For example, my advisor, Nestor, is doing um, a, a phase curve observations of a planet called a super Earth um, to look to see if it has an atmosphere at all. So that is a potential thing. Okay, uh, another question in the chat. Uh, oxygen absorption is weak compared with, say, water. Do you expect difficulty detecting oxygen in exoplanet atmospheres? Um, yes and no. So um, yes, it, it, oxygen absorption is significantly weaker than water. Um, but we've seen water is pretty standard at this point. Um, we can find water um, in basically any planet we look at at this point because we've become very used to it because of the band. Uh, so the main band that we see water in with JWST is the same band that we see water in with the Hubble Space Telescope. And so we've become very good at um, doing the science in this sort of wavelength uh, range. Um, oxygen is a little bit more difficult for a bunch of reasons. Um, we haven't been able to do as much of these types of observations because Hubble doesn't uh, 
cover these wavelength ranges and also because observations of the ground of oxygen are essentially impossible because you're looking through oxygen to observe oxygen, which is very, very difficult. Um, and so it's a little bit difficult to say if we're going to have difficulty because we, we've never seen it. And so we don't know um, if it's going to be common or not. Um, so my answer to that is I will get back to you on that in like two years. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. Al wants to know, did you attend BPAA programs when you were living on Bainbridge? <laughs> if, if so, how important were they to inspiring you to become an astronomer? <laughs> yeah, um, I actually attended, I didn't attend very many, but I attended one that was really important um, when I was living on Bainbridge. Um, when I was a senior in high school, um, I did the Running Start program in which I took um, college classes as a high school senior and I took an astronomy class and it was extra credit to come to one of the BPAA shows and at that BPAA show they talked about exoplanets. Mm -hmm. um, they talked about, um, I remember uh, there was talk about sub-Neptunes and I remember being like wow that was really cool and I remember this really well because there was a suggestion to download um, an exoplanet app that had all of the exoplanets in it. And I remember going to college with that app and having it in my first ever day of astronomy. Um, I think that there would be some very interesting, um, for example, if we found life elsewhere in the universe, I think it would be a very interesting, um, it would have a very interesting effect on global politics and also uh, psychology and philosophy and all these things. Um, I'm not sure how much the other parts of astronomy will affect anything on Earth. Um, besides maybe um, the biggest way that astronomy tends to affect other things on Earth is through, for example, um, the building of telescopes, which is a very controversial topic. For example, in Hawaii at the moment, um, there's a lot of controversy over building large telescopes on what's seen as sacred ground for Hawaiians. Um, and so that's the biggest thing that I could see happening with astronomy in the relatively near future, unless we find something like aliens. Um, but you never know, maybe someone will get very excited over a galaxy or something. Okay, we, we lost you for a bit there, Natalie, but it sounds like the folks in the audience there on Zoom were asking you questions, mm. so, so that's good. Are there any other questions either in the room? Oh, we've got one here, go ahead. If you find evidence of water on an exoplanet, can you not automatically assume that oxygen is there, molecular oxygen is there also? Um, yeah, you probably can, um, at least in um, uh, these very hot planets where water is dissociating, um, and especially in the upper atmosphere where um, there's like photo dissociation happening, which is the interaction of charged particles with like, the upper atmosphere, um, you can. Um, but the big thing about direct detection is, um, you find out from direct det detection, you find out the abundance of the, the molecule or the element. Um, and so like, for example, knowing the relative ratio of something like water to something like oxygen tells you a lot about the surface conditions. Um, also anything like a carbon cycle. Um, and in fact, um, the big way that we think that we might be able to discover biosignatures with JWST would be seeing the relative amounts of these different species. Um, and so that's why these um, kind of these abundance measurements, which are only possible if you have direct detection, um, are really important. Well, also the, um, I mean, the, in the history of the Earth, CO2 was dominant. And there was no, during, while there were oceans on the present, the only reason we had oxygen in the, in the atmosphere was the blue green algae converting the mm -hmm. CO2. So, I mean, yep. you can't assume that oxygen is there because water is there. Yeah, yeah, no, you definitely can't. Well, you can assume in different parts of the atmosphere, maybe because of things like photo dissociation, but it's probably rapidly destroyed in those scenarios anyway, so yeah. It seems there would be a very, very small percentage of transits that we could observe, right? Because most mm -hmm. most of them would be in directions. If you think about our solar system, you have to be in the plane of the solar system to see the transit and, you, and there's so many other angles. What Do you know what the approximation is? Are we seeing like one in a thousand maybe? 
Yeah, that's a that's actually a really good question. Um, this is a big area of research, um, especially because um, so, for example, in our solar system, all our planets are on the plane of the sun. Um, and this is true because we live in a relatively quiet system, but this is not true for all exoplanet systems. A lot of exoplanets are relatively widely perturbed, either by companions, by binary stars, by interactions with other systems, etc. Um, and so knowing exactly what the geometry of um, a transit is or the, the likelihood of the geometry of a transit happening is not necessarily as easy as, um, for example, like if it was, if we knew that all stars formed on the plane or all planets formed on the plane of their star, it would be a very simple geometry question. It would basically be, um, you can calculate the random likelihood. Um, it would be about so we don't, it doesn't have to be exactly edge on in order to, for you to observe it. Uh, it's, some, it's characterized as something called the impact parameter, which is how close to the center of the star it is. Um, and we can see about a few degrees in either direction. Um, and so you could do that sort of calculation and get a statistical uncertainty. Um, but as, because that assumption isn't always correct, it's not necessarily that easy. Um, but we do think it's about, it's a few percent of the total planets we're seeing. And we take that into consideration with all of our statistical um, calculations that we do with um, exoplanet surveys, for example, um, because we know that at most we'd be seeing, seeing say five, six percent of exoplanets through transits, yeah. Okay, uh, another question in the chat. Actually, another, two more in the chat. Um, what will be the next space telescope and when will it be launched and what will it look for? That's a really good question. Um, so the next space telescope has already been decided. It is the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope. It will be launched in actually just only a few years from now. Um, it is a kind of a weird telescope. It basically happened because NASA gave us an old satellite and said, do you want to launch this? And we said yes. Um, but the next telescope beyond that is kind of a more interesting question. Um, so NASA this year, well, it happened this year because everything was weird because of the pandemic, but um, it was supposed to be in 2020, had the decadal, which is the um, when the entire community comes together and basically decides what the priorities for the next decade and really more like 30 years um, of science is. Um, and the decadal for this cycle um, put exoplanets as the number one priority um, of astronomy for the next at least decade. Um, and it suggested that the best use would be a large um, ultraviolet to optical telescope to act in conjunction with JWST. Um, and so we are very, uh, it, a bunch of missions were basically put forward by the community um, with teams to um, be suggested as the next large telescope. By large telescope, I mean billion dollar class telescope. Um, and NASA kind of joined two of them together, one called Louvoir and one called Habex. Um, and so we are calling it LUVEX right now. <laughs> um, and the, the goal of this telescope would be to look at the atmospheres of habitable planets um, or habitable zone planets um, as its main priority. Um, so the launch date for this telescope would be somewhere around 2040 is the current thought, um, but who really knows? <laughs> JWST was supposed to launch, I believe, for the first time in 2008. Mm -hmm. So things tend to take a little bit of a step back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can read it. Um, if there's vegetation on TRAPPIST-1E, what type of vegetative red edge is expected? What color is expected for plant life orbiting a red dwarf? This is a really good question. Um, this, so the vegetative red edge um, is something that happens on Earth where because of um, the color of plant life on Earth, which is overwhelmingly green, um, we see a rise in the reflectance due to essentially the combination of such a large fraction of the Earth's surface being covered by the same color. Um, now, the reason why it happens at this particular wavelength is, and the reason why plant life on Earth is green is because of the type of star that we orbit. Um, we orbit what is called a G star, which is, um, well, it's considered to be the middle type of star, but that's pretty biased. It's because we set our own star as the standard. Um, but the wavelength at which these um, G stars peak at is at this greenish color. Um, and so that's what life um, basically decided to choose 
or not decided to choose what evolution chose as the most optimal wavelength to absorb um, and then reflect. Um, and so what's being asked here is that so red, uh, so TRAPPIST-1 is a very small star and small stars are cooler. And because it's cooler, its wavelength peaks at a different wavelength. Um, and in this case, well, so it's a little bit of an open question. Um, how if like, for example, there's some sort of evolutionary um, process that prefers like longer wavelength light or shorter wavelength light, like we don't know. There's a lot of problems with things like habitability in life because we only have one example. Um, not having multiple samples in a, in a scientific study is very dangerous. Um, but if we were to, uh, if there was to be plant life that evolved in the same way on the TRAPPIST system as it evolved on Earth, um, it would be much redder. Um, the, uh, the types of light that it sees would be like in the IR, um, most likely. So that's kind of a broad question. Honestly, the biologists are much better people to answer this question than I am. Um, but this is what I've heard being said um, by astronomers. Um, OK, I can answer the next or ask the same, next question in the chat, too, which is I'm just curious, uh, would Earth, wait, OK, would Earth be considered an exoplanet for an Earth outsider observer. Um, yeah, so Earth um, would be an exoplanet for any other system that was able to see us. Um, this is actually a bit of science that um, is very popular at the moment is observations of Earth as an exoplanet um, to see what we would look like to other beings in the universe. Um, there's even, there's a group at Cornell um, that published a paper last year where they calculated what so what stars would be able to see us as an exoplanet. So they looked at planets in which the, the transit geometry would work out in which they would see us transit and they calculated what sorts of signals that they would see. Um, and so if <laughs> we get some sort of signal from one of these planets, we can assume that they saw us. Okay, David Fox says great talk in the chat. <laughs> and uh, I think everybody here is happy. Any more questions? No? Okay, we're good. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for having me. Okay, so we'll let you go to bed. I assume you're going to go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> Great. We'll be in touch for uh, for your next, uh, your next talk uh, sometime soon. Of course, yeah. Great. Bye, everyone. <laughs>